Chapter 56 For the next month, Belle wouldn't speak to Kunta, and even carried her own basket back to the big house after she had come for the vegetables. Then, early one Monday morning, she came rushing out to the garden, eyes wide with excitement, and blurted, Sheriff just rid off. He told Massa been some big fightin' up north somewhere called Boston. It's dem white folks so mad bout dem king's taxes from cross to big water. Massa got Luther hitchin' de buggy to get to de county seat. He show upset. Supper time found everyone clustered around the fiddler's hut for his and the gardener's opinions. The gardener being Slave Row's oldest person, the fiddler its best traveled and most worldly. When it was, somebody asked, and the gardener said, well, anything we hears from up north got to have happened a while back. The fiddler added, I heard that from up round where that Boston is, ten days is the quickest that fast hosses can get word here to Virginia. In the deepening dusk, the masses buggy returned. Luther hurried to Slave Row with further details he had picked up. Days telling it that one night some of dem Boston peoples got so mad bout dem king's taxes, they marched on dat king's soldiers. Dem soldiers commenced to shootin', and first one kilt was a <laughs> came a crispus addicts. They callin' it de Boston Massacre. Little else was talked of for the next few days, as Quinta listened, unsure what it was all about, and why white folks and even the blacks, were so agog about whatever was happening so far away. Hardly a day passed without two or three passing slaves you hoo a hooing from the big road with a new rumor, and Luther kept bringing regular reports from house slaves, stable hands, and other drivers he talked with on every journey the Massa made to attend sick people or to discuss what was going on in New England with other masses in their big houses, or the county seat or nearby towns. White folks ain't got no secrets, the fiddler said to Kunta. They swamped they selves with <laughs> listening. If they eat and talkin', Gal servin' em actin' dumber than she is, memberin' every word she hear. Even when white folks get so scared they start spellin' out words. If any <coughs> round, well, plenty house <coughs> ain't long repeatin' it letter for letter to the nearest <coughs> what can spell and piece together what was said. I mean dem don't sleep for day knows what dem white folks was talking about. What was happening up north continued to arrive piece by piece through the summer and into the fall. Then, as time passed, Luther began to report that as exercised as white folks were about the taxes, that wasn't their only worry. Day saying it some counties got twice many <laughs> as white folks. Days worrying that King's Cross the Water might start offering us freedom to fight against these white folks. Luther waited for the gasps of his audience to subside. Fact, he said, Dunn heard some white folks so scared. Dunn took to locking day doors at night. Dunn even quit talking round a house. Quinta lay on his mattress at night for weeks afterward, thinking about freedom. As far as he could tell, it meant having no massa at all, doing as one wanted, going wherever one pleased. But it was ridiculous, he decided finally, to think that white folks would bring blacks all the way across the big water to work as slaves, and then set them free. It would never happen. Shortly before Christmas, some of Massa Waller's relatives arrived for a visit, and their black buggy driver was eating his fill in Belle's kitchen while regaling her with the latest news. Dunn heard that over in Georgia, he said, <coughs> Name a George Lyle. The Baptist white folks Dunn give him a license to preach to. <coughs> Up and down the Savannah River. 
Here to claim he gone star at African Baptist Church in Savannah. First time I heard about any church. Bell said, I heard about one foe now in Petersburg, right here in Virginia. But tell me, you heard anything about the white folks' troubles up north? Well, I hear tell while back, whole lot of important white folks had a big meeting in that Philadelphia. They call it the First Continental Congress. Bell said she had heard that. In fact, she had painstakingly read it in Massa Waller's Virginia Gazette. And then she had shared the information with the old gardener and the fiddler. They were the only ones who knew she could read a little. When they had spoken about it recently, the gardener and the fiddler had agreed that Kunta shouldn't be told of her ability. True, he knew how to keep his mouth shut, and he had come to understand and express things unexpectedly well for anyone from Africa, but they felt that he couldn't yet fully appreciate how serious the consequences would be if the Massa got the slightest hint that she could read. He would sell her away that same day. By early the next year, 1775, almost no news from any source was without some further development in Philadelphia. Even from what Kunta heard and could understand, it was clear that the white folks were moving toward a crisis with the king across the big water in the place called England. And there was a lot of exclaiming about some Massa Patrick Henry having cried out, Give me liberty or give me death. Kunta liked that, but he couldn't understand how somebody white could say it. White folks looked pretty free to him. Within a month came news that two whites named William Dawes and Paul Revere had raced on horses to warn somebody of hundreds of King's soldiers heading for somewhere called Concord to destroy rifles and bullets that were stored there. And soon afterward, they heard that in a furious battle at Lexington, some Minutemen had lost only a handful while killing over 200 King soldiers. Scarcely two days later came word that yet another thousand of them had fallen in a bloody battle at a place called Bunker Hill. White folks at the county seat is laughing, saying them King's soldiers wears red coats not to show the blood, said Luther. Heard some of that blood getting spilt by <laughs> fighting alongside white folks. Wherever he went now, he said he kept on hearing that Virginia masses were showing greater than usual signs of mistrust toward their slaves. Even the oldest house <laughs> relishing his new importance along Slave Row, Luther arrived home from a trip in June to find an anxious audience awaiting his latest news. It's some massa George Washington got picked to run an army. <laughs> Told me he's heard he got a big plantation with plenty of slaves. He said he had also heard that some New England slaves had been set free to help fight the king's redcoats. I knowed it, the fiddler exclaimed. <laughs> Gone get dragged in it and killed, just like that French and Indian war. Den soon's it's over. White folks be right back whippin'. Maybe not, said Luther. Heard some white folks called themselves Quakers done put together an anti-slavery society up in that Philadelphia. Reckon day some white folks just don't believe in being slaves. Me neither, put in the fiddler. The frequent bits of news that Bell contributed would sound as if she had been discussing them with the Massa himself, but she finally admitted that she had been listening at the keyhole of the dining room whenever the Massa had guests, for not long ago he had curtly told her to serve them and leave immediately, closing the door behind her. Then she had heard him lock it. And I knows that man's better than his mammy, she muttered indignantly. What'd he say in there after he locked the door? Asked the fiddler impatiently. Well, tonight he say don't seem no way not to fight dem English folks. He speck they goin' send big boatloads of soldiers over here. He say it's over 200,000 slaves just in Virginia. And the biggest worry is if dem Englishmen's ever riles up us. <laughs> against white folks. Massa say he feel loyal to the king as any man. 
but ain't nobody can stand them taxes. General Washington doesn't stop them taking any more in the army, said Luther, but some free up north is arguing days part of this country and wants to fight. They show gone get day chance, just let enough white folks get killed, said the fiddler. Dem free is crazy. But the news that followed two weeks later was even bigger. Lord Dunmore, the royal governor of Virginia, had proclaimed freedom for slaves who would leave their plantations to serve on his English fleet of fishing boats and frigates. Massa fit to be tied, reported Bell. Man come to dinner, say lot of talk about chain and or jail and slaves, suspicion to join an up, or even thinking about it, and maybe kidnapping and hanging that Lord Dunmore. Kunda had been given the job of watering and feeding the horses of the flushed, agitated masses who visited the grim-jawed Massa Waller. And Kunta told how some of the horses had sweat-soaked flanks from long, hard riding, and how some of the masses were even driving their own buggies. One of them, he told the others, was John Waller, the Massa's brother, the man who had bought Kunta when they took him off the boat eight years before. After all that time, he had known that hated face at first glance, but the man had tossed the reins to Kunta with no apparent recognition. Don't act so surprised, said the fiddler, Massa like him ain't goin say howdy to no especially if and he members who you is. Over the next few weeks, Bell learned at the keyhole of the masses and his visitors' alarm and fury that thousands of Georgia, South Carolina, and Virginia slaves were said to be boldly fleeing their plantations to join Lord Dunmore. Some said they had heard that most of the fleeing slaves were simply heading for the north but all the whites agreed on the need to start breeding more bloodhounds. Then one day Massa Waller called Bell into the living room and twice read slowly aloud a marked item in his Virginia Gazette. He ordered Bell to show it to the slaves and handed the paper to her. She did as she was told, and they reacted just as she had, less with fear than anger. Be not, ye tempted to ruin yourselves whether we suffer or not if you desert us you most certainly will before returning the gazette bell spelled out for her own information several other news items in the privacy of her cabin and among them were reports of actual or predicted slave revolts later the massa shouted at her for not returning the paper before supper and bell apologized in tears but soon she was sent out again with another message, this time the news that Virginia's House of Burgesses had decreed death without benefit of clergy for all or other slaves conspiring to rebel or make insurrections. What do it mean? a field hand asked, and the fiddler replied, Uprise, and white folks won't call no preacher when they kills you. Luther heard that some white folks called Tories and some other kind called Scotchmen were joining with the English, and sheriffs told me that Lord Dunmore's ruin and river plantations burn in big houses and tellin' the he free em if and they come and join him. Luther told how in Yorktown and other towns any blacks caught out at night were being whipped and jailed. Christmas that year was but a word. Lord Dunmore was reported to have barely outraced a mob onto the safety of his flagship. And a week later came the incredible news that Dunmore, with his fleet off Norfolk, had ordered the city emptied within one hour. Then his guns began a bombardment that set raging fires, and much of Norfolk had been reduced to ashes. In what was left, Bell reported, Water and food were scarce, and fever had broken out, killing so many that Hampton Road's waters were dotted with bloated bodies, drifting ashore with the tides. Say days burying em in sand and mud, said Luther, and Lada 
near about starving and scared to death on them English boats. Mulling over all these terrible events, Kunta felt that in some unfathomable way, all of this suffering must have some meaning, some reason, that Allah must have willed it. Whatever was going to happen next, both to black and white, must be his design. It was early in 1776 when Kunta and the others heard that a General Cornwallis had come from England, with boatfuls of sailors and soldiers trying to cross the big York River. But a great storm had scattered the boats. They heard next that another Continental Congress had met, with a group of masses from Virginia moving for complete separation from the English. Then two months of minor news passed, before Luther returned from the county seat, with the news that after another meeting on July 4th, all the white folks I seen is just carrying on, something about some decoration of independence. Heard him say Massa John Hancock done rid his name real big so the king wouldn't have to strain none to see it. On his next trips to the county seat, Luther returned with accounts he had heard that in Baltimore, a life-sized ragdoll king had been carted through the streets, then thrown into a bonfire surrounded by white people shouting, Tyrant! Tyrant! And in Richmond, rifles had been fired in volleys as shouting white people waved their torches and drank toasts to each other. Along the subdued slave row, the old gardener said, Ain't nothing neither way for to holler about. England are here, days all white folks. Later that summer, Bell bustled over to Slave Row with news from a dinner guest that the House of Burgesses had just recently passed an act that say they gon' take in the army as drummers, fifers, or pioneers. What's pioneers? asked a field hand. It mean get stuck up front and get killed, said the fiddler. Luther soon brought home an exciting account of a big battle right there in Virginia that had slaves fighting on both sides. Amid a hail of musket balls from hundreds of redcoats and Tories, along with a group of convicts and blacks, a smaller force of white colonials and their blacks were driven across a bridge. But in the rear, a slave soldier named Billy Flora had ripped up and hurled away enough planks from the bridge that the English forces had to stop and withdraw, saving the day for the colonial forces. Rip up a bridge? That must have been some strong <laughs> the gardener exclaimed. When the French entered the war on the colonial side in 1778, Bell relayed reports that one state after another was authorizing the enlisting of slaves with the promise of freedom when the war was won. Now ain't but two states left that say they ain't gon' never let fight. That's South Carolina and Georgia. That the only thing good I ever heard about neither one of them, said the fiddler. As much as he hated slavery, it seemed to Kunta that no good could come of the white folks giving guns to blacks. First of all, the whites would always have more guns than the blacks, so any attempt to revolt would end in defeat. And he thought about how in his own homeland, guns and bullets had been given by the two bob to evil chiefs and kings, until blacks were fighting blacks, village against village, and selling those they conquered, their own people, into chains. Once Bell heard the masses say that as many as 5,000 blacks, both free and slave, were in the fighting that was going on, and Luther regularly brought stories of blacks fighting and dying alongside their masses. Luther also told of some all-black companies from up north, even one all-black battalion called the Bucks of America. Even they colonel is a said Luther. His name Middleton. He looked archly at the fiddler. You won't ever guess what he is. What you mean, said the fiddler. He a fiddler too. And it's time to do some fiddling. Then Luther hummed and sang a new song he had heard in the county seat. The catchiness of it was easy to pick up, and soon others were singing it, and still others beating time with sticks. Yankee Doodle came to town riding on a pony, 
And when the fiddler started playing, the slave row youngins began to dance and clap their hands. With May of 1781 came the astounding story that redcoats on horses had ruined Massa Thomas Jefferson's plantation called Monticello. The crops had been destroyed, the barn burned, the livestock run off, and all the horses and 30 slaves had been taken. White folks say in Virginia gotta be saved, Luther reported, and soon after he told of white joy because General Washington's army was headed there. And a plenty is in it. October brought reports that the combined forces of Washington and Lafayette had poured shot and shell into Yorktown, attacking England's Cornwallis. And they soon heard of other battles raging in Virginia, New York, North Carolina, Maryland, and other states. Then in the third week of the month came the news that said even slave row shouting, Cornwallis Dunst surrendered, war am over, freedom am won. Luther barely had time to sleep between buggy journeys now, and the massa was even smiling again for the first time in years, said Bell. Everywhere I's been, de <laughs> is hollering loud as white folks, said Luther but he said that slaves everywhere had rejoiced most over their special hero, old Billy Flora, who had recently been discharged and carried his faithful musket back to Norfolk. Y'all come here, Bell shouted, summoning the others on Slave Row not long after. Massa just told me they done named that Philadelphia first capital of the United States. But it was Luther who told them later. Massa Jefferson done put up some kind of manumission act. It says Massa's got the right to free. But tell me them Quakers and anti-slavery folks and free. Up north is hollering and going on because the act say Massa's don't have to. Not less than they wants to. When General Washington disbanded the army early in November of 1783, formally ending what most people had begun calling the Seven Years' War. Bell told everyone in Slave Row, Massa say goin be peace now. Ain't goin be no peace, not long as it's white folks, said the fiddler sourly, cause ain't nothin they loves better in killin. His glance flicked among the faces around him. Just watch what I tell you. It's goin be worse than it was for us. Quinta and the old gardener sat later, talking quietly. You seen a plenty since you been here. How long it's been, anyhow. Quinta didn't know, and that troubled him. That night, when he was alone, Quinta spent hours carefully arranging into piles of twelve all of the multicolored pebbles that he had dropped faithfully into his gourd with each new moon. He was so stunned by what the stones finally told him that the gardener never learned the answer to his question. Surrounding him there on the dirt floor of his hut were seventeen piles of stones. He was thirty-four rains old. What in the name of Allah had happened to his life? He had been in the white man's land as long as he had lived in Jafur. Was he still an African, or had he become a as the others called themselves? Was he even a man? He was the same age as his father when he had seen him last. Yet he had no sons of his own, no wife, no family, no village, no people, no homeland, almost no past at all that seemed real to him any more, and no future he could see. It was as if the Gambia had been a dream he'd had once long ago. Or was he still asleep? And if he was... Would he ever waken? Chapter 57 Quinta didn't have long to brood about the future, for a few days later came news that took the plantation by storm. A captured runaway house girl, reported Bell breathlessly after the sheriff arrived for a hushed meeting with the massa behind closed doors, had admitted under a lashing that her crude escape route had been drawn for her by none other than the masses driver, Luther. Storming out to slave row before Luther could run away, 
Massa Waller confronted him with the sheriff and demanded angrily to know if it was true. Terrified, Luther admitted that it was. Red-faced with rage, the Massa lifted his arm to strike, but when Luther begged for mercy, he lowered it again and stood there staring silently at Luther for a long moment, tears of fury welling in his eyes. At last he spoke, very quietly, Sheriff, put this man under arrest and take him to jail. He is to be sold at the next slave auction. And without another word, he turned and walked back to the house, ignoring Luther's anguished sobs. Speculation had hardly begun about who would be assigned to replace him as the Massa's driver when Bell came out one night and told Kunta that the Massa wanted to see him right away. Everyone watched, but no one was surprised, as he went cripping into the house behind Bell. Though he suspected why he had been called, Kunta felt a little scared, for he had never spoken to the Massa or even been beyond Bell's kitchen and the big house during all his sixteen years on the plantation. As Bell led him through the kitchen into a hallway, his eyes goggled at the shining floor and the high, papered walls. She knocked at a huge, carved door. He heard the Massa say, Come in, and Bell went on inside, turning to beckon expressionlessly to Kunta. He couldn't believe the size of the room. It seemed as big as the inside of the barn. The polished oaken floor was covered with rugs, and the walls were hung with paintings and tapestries. The richly dark, matched furniture was waxed, and long rows of books sat on recessed shelves. Massa Waller sat at a desk reading under an oil lamp with a circular shade of greenish glass, and his finger held his place in his book when, after a moment, he turned around to face Quinta. Toby, I need a buggy driver. You've grown into a man on this place, and I believe you're loyal. His widely set blue eyes seemed to pierce Kunta. Bell tells me that you never drink. I like that, and I've noticed how you conduct yourself. Massa Waller paused. Bell shot a look at Kunta. Yes, Massa, he said quickly. You know what happened to Luther? The Massa asked. Yes, said Kunta. The Massa's eyes narrowed, and his voice turned cold and hard. I'd sell you in a minute, he said. I'd sell Bell if you two had no better sense. As they stood there silently, the Massa reopened his book. All right, start driving me tomorrow. I'm going to Newport. I'll show you the way until you learn. The Massa glanced at Bell. Get him the proper clothes and tell the fiddler that he'll be replacing Toby in the garden. Yes, Massa, Bell said as she and Kunta left. Bell brought him the clothing, but it was the fiddler and the old gardener who supervised Kunta's dressing early the next morning in the starched and pressed canvas trousers and cotton hemp shirt. They didn't look too bad, but that black string tie they helped him put on next, he felt, made him look ridiculous. Newport ain't nowhere to drive, just right up next to Spotsylvania Courthouse, said the old gardener. It's one of the old Waller family big houses. The fiddler, who by this time had been told of his own new duties as well as Quinta's, was walking around inspecting him with an expression that revealed transparently both his pleasure and his jealousy. You a show enough special <laughs> Now, no two ways about it. Just don't let it get to your head. It was unnecessary advice for one who even after all this time, found no dignity in anything he was made to do for the white man. But whatever small excitement Kunta felt at the prospect of being able to leave his garden behind and widen his horizons, as his uncles, Jenna and Salum, had done, was soon forgotten in the heat of his new duties. Summoned by his patience at any hour of the day or night, Massa Waller would call Kunta rushing from his hut to hitch the horses for breakneck rides to homes sometimes many miles from the plantation down narrow, twisting roads that were hardly smoother than the countryside around them. 
lurching and careening over ruts and potholes, laying on the whip until the horses heaved for breath. Massa Waller clinging to his canopied rear seat, Kunta showed a knack for the reins that somehow saw them safely to their destination, even in the spring thaw, when the red clay roads turned into treacherous rivers of mud. Early one morning, the Massa's brother John came galloping in, frantically reporting that his wife's labor pains had begun, although it was two months before the birth had been expected. Massa John's horse was too exhausted to return without rest, and Kunta had driven both of them back to Massa John's barely in the nick of time. Kunta's own overheated horses hadn't cooled down enough for him to give them water when he heard the shrill cries of a newborn baby. It was a five-pound girl. The Massa told him on their way home, and they were going to call her Anne. And so it went. During that same frantic summer and fall, there was a plague of black vomiting that claimed victims all over the county, so many that Massa Waller and Kunta couldn't keep up with them, and soon drove themselves into fever, downing copious dosages of quinine to keep them going. They saved more lives than they lost. But Kunta's own life became a blur of countless big house kitchens, catnaps on pallets in strange huts or in haymows, and endless hours of sitting in the buggy outside shanties and grand homes listening to the same cries of pain while he waited for the Massa to reappear so that they could return home, or more often drive on to the next patient. But Massa Waller didn't travel always in the midst of crisis. Sometimes entire weeks would pass without anything more urgent than routine house calls or visits to one of a seemingly inexhaustible assortment of relatives and friends whose plantations were located somewhere within driving distance. On such occasions, particularly in the spring and summer, when the meadows were thick with flowers, wild strawberries, and blackberry thickets, and the fences were trellised with lushly growing vines, the buggy would roll along leisurely behind its finely matched pair of bay horses, Massa Waller sometimes nodding off under the black canopy that shielded him from the sun. Everywhere were quail whirring up, brilliant red cardinals hopping about, meadowlarks and whippoorwills calling out. Now and then a bull snake sunning on the road, disturbed by the oncoming buggy, would go slithering for safety, or a buzzard would go flapping heavily away from its dead rabbit. But Quinta's favorite sight was a lonely old oak or cedar in the middle of a field. It would send his mind back to the baobabs of Africa, and to the elders saying that wherever one stood alone, there had once been a village. At such times, he would think of Jafur. On his social calls, the Massa went most often to visit his parents at Enfield, their plantation on the borderline between King William County and King and Queen County. Approaching it, like all the Waller family big houses, the buggy would roll down a long double avenue of huge old trees and stop beneath the massive black walnut tree on the wide front lawn. The house, which was much bigger and richer looking than the masses, sat on a slight rise overlooking a narrow, slow-moving river. During his first few months of driving, the cooks at the various plantations in whose kitchens Kunta was fed, but most especially Hattie May, the fat, haughty, shiny black cook at Enfield, had eyed him critically as fiercely possessive of their domains as Bell was at Massa Waller's. Confronted with Quinta's stiff dignity and reserve, though, none quite ventured to challenge him in any way directly, and he would silently clean his plate of whatever they served him, excepting any pork. Eventually, however, they began to get used to his quiet ways, and after his sixth or seventh visit, even the cook at Enfield apparently decided that he was fit for her to talk to, and deigned to speak to him. "'You know where you at?' she asked him suddenly one day in the middle of his meal. He didn't answer, and she didn't wait for one. 
This here is the first United States House of the Wallers. Nobody but Wallers lived here for 150 years. She said that when Enfield had been built, it was only half its present size, but that later another house had been brought up from near the river and added on. Our fireplace's bricks brought in boats from England, she said proudly. Kunta nodded politely as she droned on, but he was unimpressed. Once in a while, Massa Waller would pay a visit to Newport, Kunta's first destination as a driver. It seemed impossible to believe that an entire year had passed since then. And old uncle and aunt of the masses lived there in a house that looked to Kunta very much like Enfield. While the white folks ate in the dining room, the cook at Newport would feed Kunta in the kitchen, strutting around with a large ring of keys on a thin leather belt around the top of her apron. He had noticed by now that every senior housemaid wore such a key ring. On it, he had learned, in addition to her keys for the pantry, the smokehouse, the cooling cellar, and other food storage places, were the keys to all the rooms and closets in the big house. Every cook he'd met would walk in a way to make those keys jangle as a badge of how important and trusted she was, but none jangled them louder than this one. On a recent visit, having decided, like the cook at Enfield, that he might be all right after all, she pressed a finger to her lips and led Kunta on tiptoe to a small room farther within the big house. Making a great show of unlocking the door with one of the keys at her waist, she led him inside and pointed to one wall. On it was a mounted display of what she explained were the Waller's coat of arms, their silver seal, a suit of armor, silver pistols, a silver sword, and the prayer book of the original Colonel Waller. Pleased at the ill-concealed amazement of Kunta's face, she exclaimed, Old Colonel built that Enfield, but he buried right here. And walking outside, she showed him the grave and its lettered tombstone. After a minute, as Kunta stared at it, she asked with a rehearsed casualness, You want to know what it say? Kunta nodded his head, and rapidly she read the long-since-memorized inscription. Sacred to memory of Colonel John Waller, gentlemen, third son of John Waller and Mary Key, who settled in Virginia in 1635, from Newport Paganal, Buckinghamshire. Several cousins of masses, Kunta soon discovered, lived at Prospect Hill, also in Spotsylvania County. Like Enfield, the big house here was one and a half stories high, as were nearly all very old big houses. The cook at Prospect Hill told him, because the king had put an extra tax on two-story houses. Unlike Enfield, Prospect Hill was rather small, smaller than the other Waller family houses. But none, she informed him, whether or not he cared to listen, had as wide an entrance hall or as steep a circular stairway. You ain't going upstairs. But no reason you can't know us got four poster canopy beds up there so tall they has to use step ladders, and under them is chillin's trundle beds. And let me tell you something, dem beds, dem chimney bricks, house beams, hinges on the doors, everything's us and got in here was made or did by slave. In the backyard, she showed Kunta the first weaving house he had ever seen and nearby were the slave quarters, which were about the same as theirs, and below them was a pond, and farther beyond was a slave's graveyard. I knows you ain't want to see dat, she said, reading his thoughts. He wondered if she also knew how strange and sad he found it to hear her talking, as so many others did, about usins, and acting as if she owned the plantation she lived on instead of the other way around. Chapter 58 How come Massa been seeing so much of that no-good brother of his last few months? asked Belle one evening after Kunta trudged in, after arriving home from a visit to Massa John's plantation. I thought there was no love lows between them two. 
Looked to me like Mass had just gone crazy about that little old gal baby they got, said Quinta wearily. She show is a cute little thing, said Belle. After a thoughtful pause, she added, Reckon Missy Ann seemed to Massa like that little gal of his own he lost. That hadn't occurred to Quinta, who still found it difficult to think of two Bob as actual human beings. She going to be a whole year old this November, ain't she? asked Belle. Quinta shrugged. All he knew was that all this running back and forth between the two plantations was wearing ruts in the road and in his rump. Even though he had no use for Massa John's sour-faced buggy driver, Roosby, he told Belle he was grateful for the rest when the Massa invited his brother to visit him for a change the week before. As they were leaving that day, Belle recalled the Massa had looked as happy as his little niece when he tossed her in the air and caught her, squealing and laughing, before handing her up to her mother in the buggy. Quinta hadn't noticed, and he didn't care, and he couldn't understand why Belle did. One afternoon, a few days later, on their way home from a house call on one of Massa Waller's patients at a plantation not far from Newport, the Massa called out sharply to Quinta that he had just passed a turn they should have taken. Quinta had been driving without seeing. So shocked was he by what he had just seen at the patient's big house. Even as he muttered an apology and turned the buggy hastily around, he couldn't rid his mind of the sight of the heavy, very black, wool-off-looking woman he had seen in the backyard. She had been sitting on a stump, both of her large breasts hanging out, matter-of-factly suckling a white infant at one and a black infant at the other. It was a revolting sight to Quinta, and an astonishing one. But when he told the gardener about it later, the old man said, Ain't hardly a mass in Virginia ain't sucked a black mammy, or at least was raised up by one. Almost as repulsive to Kunta was something he'd seen all too much of, the kind of demeaning games that went on at the plantations he visited between white and black young'uns of about the same age. The white children seemed to love nothing more than playing massa and pretending to beat the black ones, or playing hosses by climbing onto their backs and making them scramble about on all fours. Playing school, the white children would teach the black to read and write, with many cuffings and shriekings about their dumbness. Yet after lunch, which the black children would spend fanning the massa and his family with leafy branches to keep flies away, the white and black children would lie down together and take naps on pallets. After seeing such things, Quinta would always tell Belle, the fiddler and the gardener, that he'd never understand the two bob if he lived to a hundred reigns. And they would always laugh and tell him that they'd seen this sort of thing, and more, all of their lives. Sometimes, they told him, as the white and black youngins grew up together, they became very attached to one another. Bell recalled two occasions when the Massa had been called to attend white girls who had fallen ill when their lifelong black playmates had been sold away for some reason. Their masses and mistresses had been advised that their daughter's hysterical grief was such that they might well grow weaker and weaker until they died, until their little girl friends were quickly found and brought back. The fiddler said that a lot of black youngins had learned to play the violin, the harpsichord, or other instruments by listening and observing as their white playmates were taught by music masters, whom their rich masses had hired from across the big river. The old gardener said that on his second plantation, a white and black boy grew up together until finally the young Massa took the black one off with him to William and Mary College. Old Massa ain't like it at all, but old Missy say it's his if he want to. And when this get back later on, he told us in Slave Road that they was heap more young masses there with day as valets, sleeping right in the room with him. He say heap of times they take day with him to classes, then they argue later on who's learnt the most. 
That from my plantation couldn't just read and write. He could figure, too, and cite them poems and stuff they has at colleges. I got soul away around then. Wonder whatever became of him. Lucky if he ain't dead, the fiddler said, cause white folks is quick to spish in a like that be the first to hatch a uprising or a revolt somewhere. Don't pay to know too much. Just like I told this African here when he started driving Massa. Mouth shut and ears open. That's the way you learn the most. Kunta found out how true that was soon afterward, when Massa Waller offered a ride to a friend of his from one plantation to another. Talking as if he wasn't there, and saying things that Kunta would have found extraordinary, even if they hadn't known there was a black sitting right in front of them, they spoke about the frustrating slowness of their slaves' separation of cotton fibers from the seeds by hand, when demands for cotton cloth were rapidly increasing. They discussed how more and more, only the largest planters could afford to buy slaves at the robbery prices being demanded by slave traders and slave ship agents. But even if you can afford it, bigness can create more problems than it solves, said the Massa. The more slaves you've got, the likelier it is that some kind of revolt could be fomented. We should never have let them bear arms against white men during the war, said his companion. Now we witness the result. He went on to tell how, at a large plantation near Fredericksburg, some former slave soldiers had been caught just before a planned revolt, but only because the housemaid had gotten some wind of it and told her mistress in tears. They had muskets, scythe blades, pitchforks. They had even made spears, said the mass's friend. It said their plot was to kill and burn by night and hide by day and keep moving. One of their ringleaders said they expected to die, but not before they had done what the war had showed them they could do to white people. They could have cost many innocent lives, he heard the Massa reply gravely. Massa Waller went on to say that he had read somewhere that over 200 slave outbreaks had occurred since the first slave ships came. I've been saying for years that our greatest danger is that slaves are coming to outnumber whites. You're right, his friend exclaimed. You don't know who's shuffling and grinning and planning to cut your throat. Even the ones right in your house. You simply can't trust any of them. It's in their very nature. His back is rigid as a board, Quinta heard the masses say. As a doctor, more than once I've seen white deaths that, well, I'll not go into details, but let's just say I've thought some of them suspicious. Hardly feeling the reins in his hands, Quinta was unable to comprehend that they could seem so incredibly unaware of him. His mind tumbled with things that he too had heard during the nearly two years now that he had been driving the buggy for the Massa. He had heard many a whispering of cooks and maids grinning and bowing as they served food containing some of their own bodily wastes. And he had been told of white folks' meals containing bits of ground glass or arsenic or other poisons. He had even heard stories about white babies going into mysterious fatal comas without any trace of the darning needle that had been thrust by housemaids into their soft heads where the hair was thickest. And a big house cook had pointed out to him the former hut of an old mammy nurse who had been beaten badly and then sold away after severely injuring a young massa who had hit her. It seemed to Kunta that black women here were even more defiant and rebellious than the men, but perhaps it only appeared that way because the women were more direct and personal about it. They would usually take revenge against white folks who had wronged them. The men tended to be more secretive and less vengeful. The fiddler had told Kunta about a white overseer who had been hanged from a tree by the father of a black girl he had been caught raping. But violence against whites by black men was most often ignited by news of white atrocities or slave rebellions and the like. There had never been any uprisings, or even any incidents, at the Waller place, but right there in Spotsylvania County, Kunta had heard about some blacks who had hidden muskets and other weapons, and vowed to kill their masses or mistresses, or both, and put their plantations to the torch. 
and there were some men among those he worked with who would meet in secret to discuss anything good or bad that happened to slaves elsewhere, and to consider any action they might take to help, but so far they had only talked. Quinta had never been invited to join them, probably, he thought, because they felt that his foot would make him useless to them in an actual revolt. Whatever their reasons for leaving him out, he felt it was just as well. Though he wished them luck in whatever they might decide to do, Quinta didn't believe that a rebellion could ever succeed against such overwhelming odds. Perhaps, as Massa Waller had said, blacks might soon outnumber whites, but they could never overpower them, not with pitchforks, kitchen knives, and stolen muskets against the massed armies of the white nation and its cannons. But their worst enemy, it seemed to Kunta, was themselves. There were a few young rebels among them, but the vast majority of slaves were the kind that did exactly what was expected of them, usually without even having to be told. The kind white folks could, and did, trust with the lives of their own children, the kind that looked the other way when the white man took their women into haymows. Why, there were some right there on the plantation. He was sure the massa could leave unguarded for a year and find them there, still working, when he returned. It certainly wasn't because they were content. They complained constantly among themselves. But never did more than a handful so much as protest, let alone resist. Perhaps he was becoming like them, Kunta thought. Or perhaps he was simply growing up. Or was he just growing old? He didn't know. But he knew that he had lost his taste for fighting and running. And he wanted to be left alone. He wanted to mind his own business. Those who didn't had a way of winding up dead. Are you enjoying this reading so far? Welcome to Right Here Audio, the group run by students for students who wish they had someone to read academic literature to them. We read content for anyone who has a hard time reading by themselves. This includes persons with blindness, dyslexia, ADHD, and anyone else who could use some support. Do you have anything you would like us to read for you? Comment down below and we'll get started. For those of you who have supported us since day one, we are so grateful for your support. And if you're new or haven't subscribed yet, join our small community dedicated to increasing accessibility one small step at a time. Now, let's get back to our reading. Chapter 59 Dozing off in the shade of an oak tree in the backyard of a plantation where the massa was visiting to treat an entire family that had come down with a fever, Quinta woke up with a start when the evening conch horn blew to call the slaves in from the fields. He was still rubbing the sleep from his eyes when they reached the yard. Glancing up as they passed by on their way to wash up for supper, he noticed that there were about twenty or thirty of them. He looked again. Maybe he was still sleeping, but four of them, a man, a woman, and two teenage boys, were white. Days what you call indentured white folks, his friend the cook explained when he expressed his amazement to her a few minutes later. Been here about two months now. Days a family from some place crossed the big water. Massa pay their way here on de boat, so they gotta pay him back by working seven years as slaves. Then they free just like any other white folks. They live in Slave Row? asked Quinta. They got their own cabin off a ways from iron but it just as tumble down as the rest. And they eats the same mess we does, and don't get no treated no different out in the field. What they like? asked Quinta. They sticks pretty much to they selves, but they all right. Ain't like usins, but does they job and don't make no trouble for nobody. It seemed to Quinta that these white slaves were better off than most of the free whites he'd seen on the masses rounds with often as many as a dozen grown-ups and children packed on top of each other in one-room hovels on tiny patches of red clay or swampland, they scratched out a living so meager that the blacks laughingly sang a song about them. Not po white, please, O Lord, for I'd rather be a <laughs> Though he had never seen it for himself, Quinta had heard that some of these whites were so poor that they even had to eat dirt. They were certainly skinny enough 
and few of them, even the chillins, had any teeth left, and they smelled like they slept with their flea-bitten hounds, which many of them did. Trying to breathe through his mouth as he waited in the buggy outside their shacks while the massa treated one of them for scurvy or pellagra, watching the women and the children plowing and chopping while the menfolk lay under a tree with a brown jug of liquor in their dogs, all scratching. It was easy for Kunta to understand why plantation-owning masses and even their slaves scorned and sneered at them as lazy, shiftless, no-count white trash. In fact, as far as he was concerned, that was a charitable description of heathens so shameless that they managed to commit every conceivable offense against the standards of decency upheld by the most sacrilegious Muslim. On his trips with the Massa to neighboring towns, there would always be packs of them idling around the courthouse or the saloon even in the morning, dressed in their sweat-stained, greasy, threadbare cast-offs, reeking of the filthy tobacco weed, which they puffed incessantly, swigging white lightning from bottles they carried in their pockets, laughing and yelling raucously at one another as they knelt on the ground in alleys, playing cards and dice for money. By mid-afternoon, they would be making complete fools of themselves, bursting drunkenly into song, cavorting wildly up and down the street, whistling and calling out indecently to women who passed by, arguing and cursing loudly among themselves, and finally starting fights that would begin with a shove or a punch, while huge crowds of others like them would gather round to cheer them on, and end with ear-biting, eye-gouging, kicking of private parts, and bloody wounds that would almost always call for the masses' urgent attention. Even the wild animals of his homeland, it seemed to Kunta, had more dignity than these creatures. Bell was always telling stories about poor whites getting flogged for beating their wives and being sentenced to a year's imprisonment for rape. Almost as often, she told about one of them stabbing or shooting another one to death, for that they might be forced to serve six months as a slave. But as much as they loved violence among themselves, Kunta knew from personal experience that they loved violence against black people even more. It was a crowd of poor whites, male and female, that had hooted and jeered and jabbed with sticks at him and his chainmates when they were taken from the big canoe. It was a poor white overseer who had applied the lash so freely to his back at Massa John's plantation. It was white trash slave catchers who had taken such glee in chopping off his foot. And he had heard about runaways captured by paddy rollers who hadn't given them the choice he'd gotten and sent them back to their plantations, torn and broken almost beyond recognition, and divested of their manhood. He had never been able to figure out why poor whites hated blacks so much. Perhaps, as the fiddler had told him, it was because of rich whites who had everything they didn't, wealth, power, and property, including slaves who were fed, clothed, and housed while they struggled to stay alive. But he could feel no pity for them, only a deep loathing that had turned icy cold with the passing of the years since the swing of an axe held by one of them had ended forever something more precious to him than his own life, the hope for freedom. Later that summer of 1786, Kunta was returning to the plantation from the county seat with news that filled him with mixed feelings. White folks had been gathering at every corner waving copies of the Gazette and talking heatedly about a story in it that told of increasing numbers of Quakers who were not only encouraging slaves to escape, as they had been doing for several years, but had now also begun aiding, hiding, and guiding them to safety in the North. Poor whites and masses alike were calling furiously for the tarring and feathering, even hanging, of any unknown Quakers who might be even suspected of such seditious acts. Kunta didn't believe the Quakers or anybody else would be able to help more than a few of them escape, and sooner or later they'd get caught themselves. But it couldn't hurt to have white allies. They'd need them, and anything that got their owners so frightened couldn't be all bad. Later that night, after Kunta told everyone in Slave Row what he had seen and heard, the fiddler said that when he had been playing for a dance across the county the week before, 
he'd seen their mouths fallen open, when he cocked an ear close enough to overhear a lawyer there confiding to a group of big plantation owners that the will of a wealthy Quaker named John Pleasant had bequeathed freedom to his more than two hundred slaves. Bell, who arrived late, said that she had just overheard Massa Waller and some dinner guests bitterly discussing the fact that slavery had recently been abolished in a northern state called Massachusetts, and reports claimed that other states near there would do the same. What abolished mean? asked Quinta. The old gardener replied, It mean one these days, all us gon be free. Chapter 60 even when he didn't have anything he'd seen or heard in town to tell the others, Kunta had learned to enjoy sitting around the fire with them in front of the fiddler's hut. But lately, he'd found that he was spending less time talking with the fiddler, who had once been his only reason for being there, than Belle and the old gardener. They hadn't exactly cooled toward one another, but things just weren't the same anymore, and that saddened him. It hadn't brought them closer for the fiddler to get saddled with Quinta's gardening duties, though he'd finally managed to get over it. But what he couldn't seem to get used to was the fact that Quinta soon began to replace him as the plantation's best informed source of news and gossip from the outside. No one could have accused the fiddler of becoming tight-lipped, but as time went on, his famous monologues became shorter and shorter and more and more infrequent and he hardly ever played fiddle for them any more. After he had acted unusually subdued one evening, Quinta mentioned it to Belle, wondering if he had done or said anything that might have hurt his feelings. Don't flatter yourself, she told him. Day and night for months now, Fiddler been running back and forth across the county playing for the white folks. He just too woe out to run his mouth like he used to, which is fine with me and he gettin' dollar and a half a night now every time he play at one of them fancy white folks' parties he go to. Even when the master take his half, Fiddler get to keep a 75 cents for himself. So how come he bother playing foe? No, Mo. Lesson he wants to take up a collection and see if he play for a nickel. She glanced up from the stove to see if Quinta was smiling. He wasn't. But she would have fallen into her soup if he had been. She had seen him smile just once, when he heard about a slave he knew from a nearby plantation who had escaped safely to the north. I hears Fiddler planning to save up what he earned and buy his freedom from Damasa, she went on. Time he got enough to do that, said Quinta gravely. He gon' be too old to leave his hut. Belle laughed so hard she almost did fall into her soup. If the fiddler never earned his freedom, it wouldn't be for lack of trying, Quinta decided, after hearing him play at a party one night not long afterward. He had dropped off the massa and was talking with the other drivers under a tree out on the darkened lawn when the band, led by the fiddler, obviously in rare form tonight, began to play a Virginia reel so lively that even the white folks couldn't keep their feet still. From where he sat, Quinta could see the silhouettes of young couples whirling from the great hall out onto the veranda, through one door and back in again through another. When the dancing was over, everybody lined up at a long table glowing with candles and loaded with more food than Slave Row got to see in a year. And when they'd had their fill, the host's fat daughter came back three times for more. The cook sent out a tray full of leftovers and a pitcher of lemonade for the drivers. Thinking that the massa might be getting ready to leave, Quinta wolfed down a chicken leg and a delicious sticky sweet creamy something or other that one of the other drivers called a éclair. But the massas, in their white suits, stood around talking quietly for hours, gesturing with hands that held long cigars and sipping now and then from glasses of wine that glinted in the light from the chandelier that hung above them, while their wives, in fine gowns, fluttered their handkerchiefs and simpered behind their fans. The first time he had taken the mass at one of these highfalutin to-dos, as Belle called them, Krinta had been all but overwhelmed by conflicting emotions. Awe, indignation, envy, contempt, fascination, revulsion. 
but most of all a deep loneliness and melancholy from which it took him almost a week to recover. He couldn't believe that such incredible wealth actually existed, that people really lived that way. It took him a long time, and a great many more parties, to realize that they didn't live that way, that it was all strangely unreal, a kind of beautiful dream the white folks were having, a lie they were telling themselves, that goodness can come from badness, that it's possible to be civilized with one another without treating as human beings those whose blood, sweat, and mother's milk made possible the life of privilege they had. Kunta had considered sharing these thoughts with Belle or the old gardener, but he knew that he wouldn't be able to find the right words in the tubob tongue. Anyway, both of them had lived here all their lives and couldn't be expected to see it as he did, with the eyes of an outsider, one who had been born free. So as it had always been when he thought about such things, he kept it to himself, and found himself wishing that, even after all these years, he didn't still feel so alone. About three months later, Massa Waller, long with just about everybody who's anybody in the state of Virginia, according to the fiddler, was invited to attend the Thanksgiving ball his parents held each year at Enfield. Arriving late because the Massa, as usual, had to stop off and see a patient on the way, Kunta could hear that the party was well underway as they clip-clopped up the tree-lined driveway toward the big house, which was lit up from top to bottom. Pulling up at the front door, he leaped down to stand at attention while the doorman helped the Massa out of the buggy. That's when he heard it, somewhere very nearby. The edges and heels of someone's hands were beating on a drum-like gourd instrument called a qua qua, and doing it with a sharpness and power that made Quinta know the musician was an African. It was all he could do to stand still until the door closed behind the massa. Then Quinta tossed the reins to the waiting stable boy, and raced as fast as his half foot would let him around the side of the house and across the backyard. The sound, which was getting louder and louder, seemed to be coming from the middle of a crowd of blacks stomping and clapping beneath a string of lanterns that the Wallers had allowed the slaves to put up for their own Thanksgiving celebration. Ignoring their indignant exclamations as he pushed his way through them, Quinta burst into an open circle, and there he was, a lean, grey-haired, very black man squatted on the ground pounding on his qua qua between a mandolin player and two beef bone clackers. As they flicked glances up at the sudden commotion, Kunta's eyes met his, and a moment later they all but sprang toward each other, the other blacks gawking, then snickering as they embraced. Assalakium salam! Malakium salam! The words came as if neither of them had ever left Africa. Kunta shoved the older man away to arm's length. I amped seed you here before, he exclaimed. Just soul here from another plantation, the other said. My massa yo mass is youngin, said Kunta. I drives his buggy. The men around them had begun muttering with impatience for the music to start again, and they were obviously uncomfortable at this open display of Africanness. Both Kunta and the Kwa Kwa player knew they mustn't aggravate the others any further, or one of them might report to the white folks. I be back, said Kunta. Salakium salam, said the Kwa Kwa player, squatting back down. Kunta stood there for a moment as the music began again, then turned abruptly, threw the crowd with his head down, frustrated and embarrassed, and went to wait in the buggy for Massa Waller. Over the weeks that followed, Kunta's mind tumbled with questions about the Kwa Kwa player. What was his tribe? Clearly he was not Mandinka, nor any of the other tribes Kunta had ever seen or heard about either in the Gambia or on the Big Canoe. His gray hair said that he was much older. Kunta wondered if he had as many reins as Amora would by now. And how had each of them sensed that the other was a servant of Allah? The Kwa Kwa player's ease with Tubab's speech as well as with Islam said that he had been a long time in the white folk's land. 
probably for more rains than Kunta. The Kwa Kwa player said that he had recently been sold to Massa Waller's father. Where in Tubob land had he been for all those rains before now? Quinta reviewed in his mind the other Africans he had chanced to see, most of them, unfortunately, when he was with the Massa and couldn't afford even to nod at them, let alone meet them, in his three reigns of driving the Massa's buggy. Among them had even been one or two who were unquestionably Mandinkas. Most of the Africans he had glimpsed as they drove past the Saturday morning slave auctions. But after what had happened one morning about six months before, he had decided never to drive the buggy anywhere near the auctions if he could possibly avoid it, without Massa suspecting his reason. As they drove by that day, a chained young Jola woman had begun shrieking piteously. Turning to see what was the matter, he saw the wide eyes of the Jola woman fixed on him on the high seat of the buggy, her mouth open in a scream beseeching him to help her. In bitter, flooding shame, Kunta had lashed his whip down across both horses' rumps as they all but bucked ahead, jolting the Massa backward, terrifying Kunta at what he had done, but the Massa had said nothing. Once Kunta had met an African slave in the county seat while he was waiting for the Massa one afternoon, but neither one of them could understand the other's tribal language and the other man hadn't yet learned to speak the Tubob tongue. It seemed unbelievable to Kunta that it was only after twenty rains in the white folk's land that he had met another African with whom he could communicate. But for the next two months, into the spring of 1788, it seemed to Kunta that the Massa visited every patient, relative, and friend within five counties, except for his own parents at Enfield. Once he considered asking him for a traveling pass, which he had never done before, but he knew that would involve questions about where he intended to go and why. He could say that he was going to see Liza, the cook at Enfield, but that would let the Massa think there was something between them, and he might mention it to his parents, and they might mention it to Liza, and then he'd never hear the end of it, because he knew she had her eye on him and the feeling was definitely not mutual so Kunt had dropped the idea. In his impatience to get back to Enfield, he had begun to grow irritable with Belle, the more so because he couldn't talk with her about it, or so he told himself, knowing all too well her aversion toward anything African. Thinking about confiding in the fiddler and the old gardener, he had finally decided that although they wouldn't tell anyone else, they wouldn't be able to appreciate the magnitude of meeting someone to talk to from one's native land after twenty rains. Then one Sunday after lunch, without any notice at all, the Massa sent out to have him hitch up the team. He was going to Enfield. Kunta almost leaped from his seat and out the door. Bell staring after him in amazement. Liza was busy among her pots when he entered the kitchen at Enfield. He asked how she was, adding quickly that he wasn't hungry. She looked warmly at him. Ain't seen you in a time, she said, her voice soft. Then her face became somber. Heard about you and dead African we done got. Massa heard, too. Some of them <laughs> told him. But he ain't said nothing, so I wouldn't worry about it. She grasped and squeezed Kunta's hand. You just wait a minute. Kunta felt ready to explode with impatience, but Liza was deftly making and wrapping two thick beef sandwiches. She gave them to him, again pressing his hand within hers. Then she walked him toward the kitchen door, where she hesitated. Something you ain't never asked me, so I ain't told you. My mammy was an African. Reckon that's how come I likes you so much. Seeing Kunta's anxiety to leave, she turned abruptly and pointed. That hut with the broke chimney hisn. Most of the masses let go off today. They won't get back fo dark. You just be show you at yo buggy fo yo massa come out. Limping quickly down slave row, Quinta knocked at the door of the ramshackle one-room hut. Who dat? 
said the voice he remembered. Assalamualaikum salam, said Quinta. He heard a quick muffled movement within, and the door swung open wide.